Hey, AP Lit students. Um, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes and record a video for you uh, going over the opening pages of Heart of Darkness. Um, this will take you for the version that you guys have. It'll take you like right to the top of page five as we go through there. If you were present in class or if you showed up for the Learn From Home meet, um, we've already talked through the first four paragraphs. So you can skip ahead in the video if you would like to. Um, and for those of you who haven't um, already had this discussion. Really, before you watch the video, there's a couple of things you'll want to do. One is actually read those first couple of pages um, on your own, add your own ideas, go ahead and annotate what's there. Um, it is not really all that helpful just to get my ideas and put them in the text. You've got to engage with it first. You have to formulate your own ideas. And then you want to see about this sort of correspondence between what I'm saying and what you're already thinking, right? Um, you should be adding my thoughts to yours, not just using the thoughts that I'm going to present here. Um, so if you haven't done that, just stop the video now and go ahead and take a look at those first couple of pages. Add your own thoughts in, add your own annotations, maybe pay attention to things like tone and mood. Um, even if you don't fully understand what's being said or what ideas are being established, you can at least get this reaction of how does this thing feel? Um, what's the what mood is sort of being established by this image that's being created here and then again we'll add some to that as we go through our explanation um, the other thing i'll say is i'm going to as i present i'll present portions of the text as i'm talking about them and i already have things highlighted that i think are important i'm going to be just explaining those things as i go so you may find yourself needing to pause the video to take time to actually add those notes to your text um, and so, you know, plan on doing that as you watch the video. All right, so opening pages of Heart of Darkness, we just take a look at these first two paragraphs. The Nelly, a cruising yawl, swung to her anchor without a flutter of the sails and was at rest. The flood had made, the wind was nearly calm, and being bound down the river, the only thing for it was to come to and wait for the turn of tide. So here's our opening, we're sort of setting the scene, right? Um, this establishes the sort of the place where the story is going to, to be held, right? So as we talked about in the introductory lesson, um, in this story, we've got like this sort of present time where a character named Marlowe is going to be telling us the story of, of, of his trip through the Congo, right? This time in the past. And so this is the place where Marlowe is now going to tell us his story. A hey, y'all is a kind of boat. I've got a terrible drawing of it right up here for you. Um, the only reason this is important is A, it's a, it's a sailing ship. So it's important, right, that the sails are without a flutter and that the wind was nearly calm, meaning that the, the thing that would sort of drive uh, this boat, right, it has, it's, it's out of power, you might say, right? Um, it, it, it can't move right now, it's got to wait. It has to sort of reside in this moment. Um, but also you'll see with the positioning, uh, the yawl, a yawl is a kind of, of sailing boat that would have two masts. There would be one sort of in the middle of the boat and then one at the back of the boat by the deck area. And so essentially what's going to happen is you have these characters who are sitting on, around this deck area, listening to a friend sort of uh, give his talk, talk of his experience. And it will make reference to the mizzen mast. That's the mast here at the back of the boat. So if you can kind of keep that image in your head, um, that, will, that will help as we move forward. And so here, the flood had made is referring to the high tide. So essentially the Thames, the river that they're on, you know, runs out to the ocean. They have come upriver from the port, upriver from the ocean. Um, they followed the high tide in and the winds would sort of move with the tide. They have followed the high tide in They've gotten to sort of the pinnacle of the tide, right? It's the highest point. That's the flood. And now we're waiting for that tide to turn so they can move back down the river. And in that meantime, right, towards the end of the high tide and the beginning of the, of the low tide, the water is going to be relatively still, right? It's, it, there's not going to be as much sort of current within the water. And so the boat is sort of settling in here um, and it, it can't do anything. It sort of has to take this moment to be at peace, to be at rest. And there's, again, something very calming, I think, about the, the mood that's being established here, something very peaceful about this mood. 
It's also worth pointing out that they are waiting for the turn of the tide. Um, I think fundamentally there's something about this book that is about sort of uh, changing directions, right? Um, it's about maybe riding this tide of, of, of this high tide of like cultural progress or whatever that is, development, wealth, whatever that's going to be. And then here reaching the pinnacle of that and seeing that there has to be a move in a different direction, right? That there's sort of excesses and, uh, and tragedy that's created out of that. And now something else needs to occur. The sea reach of the Thames stretched before us like the beginning of an interminable waterway. In the offing, the sea and the sky were welded together without a joint. And in the luminous space, the tan sails of the barges drifting up with the tide seemed to stand still, and red clusters of canvas sharply peaked with gleams of varnished spritz. A haze rested on the low shores that ran out to sea in vanishing flatness. The air was dark above Gravesend, and farther back still seemed condensed into a mournful gloom, brooding motionless over the biggest and the greatest town on earth. So here we have the river, right? The River Thames is where, um, where we are. We are sort of upriver. We have London. Gravesend is, uh, you think about it like a town outside of London. Um, you know, if somebody asked where you guys were from, you would, you would probably say Augusta. Um, but really we're from Grovetown, right? This town's sort of outside of Augusta. And so we have a particular place looking up the river. We've got London and Gravesend. And then looking down the river, you've got the expanse of the sea running into the horizon. Uh, this style, excuse me, this style is, uh, is called Impressionism. Um, it is related to like the, the visual art movement of Impressionism. What's going to happen is we're not going to get you know, sort of detail after detail after detail, painting a vivid picture of this scene. Instead, the author is going to give us sort of the, the impression, right, the, where the light is falling, how the light is changing, where the shade is falling. And then we're painting this picture from that. In the offing, so talking about the horizon, the sea and the sky were welded together without a joint. And so this is as the sun is setting, you know, in the west, um, the sky is starting to darken over to the east, the sea is also starting to darken. And then these two colors are kind of blended together, right? Um, there's something about this moment where uh, right, the heavens and the earth are sort of melded into one. Um, it's this moment of like, of transcendence, right? Uh, of meditation, of reflection. Um, we're gonna see the characters are, are, it's gonna be referred to as like this meditative act. And so there's something about this moment that is uh, that's that's pregnant with possibility for moving forward, for changing direction, um, where it's sort of, you know, it can be a moment of enlightenment. Now, it's not clear that that's what will happen in the story. Right. It's not clear that, that that's the message that will come through. But at least in the beginning here, we have that as a kind of potential. Um, Looking at this imagery again, we have the red clusters of canvas sharply peaked with gleams of varnished spritz. The, the sprit is like a, um, if you imagine the mast, then you have like a cross beam that holds the sail out. Uh, sprit essentially runs up across the, between the mast and that cross beam, and it allows the sail to stay taut or to be extended a little. And so just this image is beautiful, right? If you, as the narrator casts our gaze down the river, um, out to the ocean, and it's blending up to the sky. Uh, on that horizon, as the sun is setting behind us, the sails of other boats down the river are catching the light of the setting sun. And so they're sort of, it's like they're bright with color, right? They're bright in their sort of these, these spots of red along that horizon, along that seascape. Um, so again, it's just this, this beautiful sort of peaceful image uh, that's created for us here. A haze rested on the low shores that ran out to sea in vanishing flatness. The air was dark above Gravesend. And later we get, it's, a, it's condensed in this mournful gloom. That gloom is it's a noun here um, referring to like the, the light, right? And so it's brooding motionless over the biggest and greatest town on earth. This is referring to London. And so the image that's now created, right, the narrator is sort of casting our gaze back up the river 
and you've got the air starting to grow dark above graves in this other town that's off to the side. And then further down the river where the sun is setting, there's this light sort of emanating from, from uh, London, right? London at the time is going to be, you know, the, the sort of the center of the, one of the biggest empires on the earth, right? And so you've got this, there's something now almost haunting, right? Um, mournful. Uh, brooding. There's something. There's something about this mood that starts to change. It, there's a difference between looking out the one side to the the blending of the heavens and the earth, and then looking up the other direction and seeing the sort of the the gloom and the the brooding light of London, right? Of of man's activity. Moving on to those next two paragraphs, we now get. Uh, a list of the people that are on the boat. And you definitely want to write this list down somewhere for yourself so you can keep these things in mind. Um, there are five, five people on the boat. I've got them here for you. We have the director of companies. You might just want to write like CEO, right? Essentially, this is a man. He's the one who owns the boat. He's captaining the ship. We'll talk a little bit more about him in a minute, but it, he's a CEO. The next we get is the lawyer. Again, he's old. He seems to be the oldest member on the boat. Um, he's reclining on a cushion on the deck. We have an accountant who's playing around with some dominoes. And then we have Marlo. Our fifth member is the, the unnamed narrator, right? So the person who is recounting this event for us. Hopefully you recognize a sort of difference in kind between these four characters. The director of companies, the lawyer, and the accountant are not given names, right? It's not the lawyer Brad. It's just the lawyer. And so these three men seem to represent also at, at, a, at a sort of symbolic level, they represent their social position. I'm going to argue that they are sort of representatives of the cultural institutions uh, that they're a part of, right? The director of companies is, this, is like business, right? And the interest of business the lawyer is going to be like our uh, our governmental institutions, right? The law, and then I think the accountant represents something like um, an economy, right? Um, maybe banking, right? There's something about like like who controls the money in some way. And then Marlo is the only character on the boat that's given a name, and so here we're gonna talk more about how he's presented to us and the connection we're supposed to make. But Marlo's clearly important, and that's because he's the guy that's going to end up telling us most of the story. He tells us about his trip um, up the Congo River, his trip dealing with uh, the Congo Free State, right, um, Belgian-controlled Congo. And so most of the story is actually going to be his recounting of this, these events in the Congo. It's being told to us secondhand by this unnamed narrator. To go to the director of companies and just add a little there. So now if, if, in my argument that basically these represent the, the cultural institutions that they're associated with, the way that they're described is going to sort of shape what Conrad is, is saying about them. So here we have the director of companies. He, he, he's wealthy, right? He's the guy that owns the boat. Um, he looked nautical. He resembled a pilot. I think it's purposefully creating this tension between the way a thing appears and the way a thing is, right? He ap appears to be a pilot. He appears to be nautical, right, of the sea. Um, he's got the right look for it. But then we're told it was hard to realize that his work was actually not in the estuary, right? Not out at the sea, not on the water, but within that brooding gloom. That brooding gloom is referring to that light above London. So we're told really his work is back there, right? Really his work is sort of the business in the city and that, um, that he's not actually uh, a seaman in the way that he would appear. So that kind of undercuts this idea we have, which to a seaman is trustworthiness personified? The suggestion would seem to be that the, the director of companies is trustworthy. But I think there's a difference between saying someone appears trustworthy and somebody is trustworthy, right? And so there is this, there's, the narrator has undercut the trustworthiness of the director of companies. Um, 
Here, if we jump down to the lawyer, he was the best of old fellows through his many years and many virtues. So if he represents sort of government institution, right, the rule of law, well, that's been around longer than, uh, than sort of, you know, modern business practices. And so uh, it's something that demands respect, right? The accountant, again, here, if this is like the economy or banking, what we see him doing is playing with dominoes, so like these pieces that are, are marked with numbers, and he's toying architecturally with the bones. Hey, I think the bones should immediately make us think of a sort of symbol of death. But it also here is referring back to, obviously, the dominoes, um, which are likely to have been made of ivory. And so he's building these little structures uh, out, of, out of the ivory, right? Sort of accounting for what's there. And there seems to be this notion that it's like the, the way, you know, who you lend money to or, or um, how money is spent in particular areas is a way of sort of building an economy, building a business, providing certain support to, you know, uh, different groups or different nations. And I wanna jump back real quickly we have between us, there was the bond of the sea. So it just like the, the, the level of the text, we've got basically these friends who are united around their love of sailing, who, you know, apparently have sailed together before, who can get together and sort of uh, laugh with each other, listen to each other's stories, have serious conversations, that they're, they're friends with each other. If we take that up to that symbolic level, there is a connection here between business, banking, and governmental institution, that the three sort of support each other, right? The three are in relationship with each other. And what I'm going to argue is that the story that Marlowe tells us, the sort of the, the uh, whatever truth, whatever testimony it is that he's going to bring, that it's really a message, not just for, you know, some friends on a boat, but that really it's a message for these sort of cultural institutions. Um, that essentially the argument is something like if there's if we need a change in direction, if we need a change in tide, it's these institutions that need a change in direction. Right. It's an it, it's these institutions that need to go the other way. So then we get to Marlowe. Marlowe is sitting cross legged. So he's got his, his legs crossed. His cheeks are sunken in. He has this yellow complexion. He has this ascetic aspect as if he's like denied himself the pleasures of the world. Uh, it probably it, he's also probably thin right from not having eaten, not having sort of been a glutton. And his arms are dropped down to his side with the palms in, of his hands outward resembling an idol. Right. And so he's in like this this meditative lotus position. And the idea here is he's being later he'll be called referred to as a Buddha. But here this is our first connection that he's this like this Buddha figure in this moment. Now, I don't want I don't want that to be taken the wrong way. I think the notion is that Marlowe, right, the Buddha is a figure of enlightenment. Marlowe's story is a story of enlightenment. Marlowe's story is not the story of a man who is perfect. And so there are going to be while you're reading through his journey, there are going to be times when you're frustrated with him where you're angry about the things that he said, right? Like that that's going to bother you. But he's a man who's clearly sort of wrestling with this, the things he has seen. He's wrestling with um, the depravity and the tragedy of the things that he's seen. And he is bringing back some message, some enlightenment, right? Some, some message of truth uh, that has the potential to cause this change. Um, here we jumping down as this mood is settling in, it's the, we felt meditative, right? Literally Marlowe is like in this pose of meditation and the men are feeling meditative. Only the gloom to the West brooding over the upper reaches became more somber every minute as if angered by the approach of the sun. So again, that, that light back up the river, uh, in London is the only thing that's sort of disturbing the, the peaceful meditation of this scene, is disturbing the sort of the possibility of this scene. All right, moving on to the next two paragraphs. And at last in its curved and imperceptible fall, the sun sank low and from glowing white changed to a dull red without rays and without heat. 
as if about to go out suddenly, stricken to death by the touch of that gloom brooding over a crowd of men. So again, we get this gloom brooding over a crowd of men. That's right, this artificial light emanating from the city. Um, you know, we might call that, that that like cultural progress, right? Or like this is the place where all these institutions are housed. Um, it's a place of, of sort of fabulous wealth for the time period. And so here it's the it's the the sun is stricken to death by it, right? Again, we see this sort of negative language associated with that. We also now, if we're talking about you know the heart of darkness, well, here it's the sun has is setting and it is becoming darker and darker and darker. And so that is going to sort of inform Marlowe's story, right? It's going to inform this meditation. Forthwith, a change came over the waters and the serenity became less brilliant, but more profound, right? This like the scene is, is beautiful as the sun is setting, you know, right? it captures the attention. And now as it gets darker, it's more, there's something more fundamental, right? There's something more um, deeply meditative about the moment. If we go skip down here, um, with reverence and affection, then to evoke the great spirit of the past upon the lower reaches of the Thames. This is, uh, that phrase is important because we're essentially, we're on this river and we get through this, this next run through, um, but I'm not going to work all the way through this, but essentially it's like, hey, this is the river from which we've released all these ships. Um, the wealth of our empire is brought here to London. Uh, you know, from these different colonies across the globe, uh, across the globe into this river. And so it's it's making them think of like the long history of all the ships that have passed up and down of these explorers and conquerors and and all of that sort of thing. So we have I like this, the adventurers and the settlers, king ships, ships, men on change, meaning right, like like uh, loaned money the dark interlopers of the Eastern trade and the commission generals of the East India fleet, right? So it's all of these explorers and conquerors and, and merchants and traders and from this like global empire that has been built over the last several hundred years. Bearing the sword and often the torch. Right? I think this is this interesting tension here and then we have bearers of a spark from the sacred fire. So the sword and the torch are, can both be sort of uh, destructive symbols, right? But we also talk about the torch as like a symbol of enlightenment. Um, here, connected with that spark of sacred fire, right? This sort of spark of, of knowledge, this spark of whatever civilization, whatever that thing might be. And so I think there's supposed to be this tension between these two ideas, the sort of the, the violence and then also uh, the, the torch of intellect, right? The, the, the light of knowledge. What greatness had not floated on the ebb of that river into the mystery of an unknown world? The dreams of men, the seed of commonwealth, the germs of empire. So we take that phrase by phrase, right? Like, and we think these are the things that motivate these people who are sailing down the Thames and out into the world, right? The dreams of men, our goals, our aspirations, what we want to accomplish, right, have been launched forth from this river. The seed of commonwealths, right? Like literally taking these like cultural institutions and planting them around the globe and, uh, and creating in these different populations uh, these same cultural institutions the germs of empires and germs is an interesting word here um, because it can it can be sort of similar right in seed as in like something that germinates um, so it, it can be the idea of like taking this idea of empire and spreading it around the globe um, but at the time it was already also being used to refer to um, like harmful microorganisms right so there is this negative, whereas these first two seem positive, positive. This could be taken two ways, and one is positive and one is negative. And again, I think Conrad is sort of purposely creating that tension of, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing, right? Um, or is it possible to say that something is both good and bad at the same time? Next, 
two paragraphs. The sun set, right? the lights out. The dusk fell on the stream and the lights began to appear along the shore. The Chapman lighthouse, a three-legged thing erect on the mud flat, shone strongly. Lights of ships moved in the fairway, a great stir of lights going up and going down. And farther west on the upper reaches, the place of the monstrous town, right? Again, the language around that light coming from London and the place of London is, uh, is we're going to see a lot of sort of negative language uh, directed towards that image. That monstrous town was still marked ominously on the sky, a brooding gloom and sunshine, a lurid glare under the stars. And so here, whereas before it was like this glooming light, now because the sky is completely dark, that light shows up more and there's something, uh, there's something lurid about this glare, right? Again, that's a comment I think on sort of, we have the attention here, the natural patterns of like the ebb and flow, the natural patterns of, of the rise and set of the sun versus the sort of man-made light, right? Man-made activity uh, that is impressed upon those natural patterns. And this also said Marlowe suddenly has been one of the dark places of the earth. So this also is referring to Thames, right? The river Thames where they are now. And so as he's thinking about, you know, as they are all sort of thinking about the, the past of this great river, he says, this has been a dark place. His remark did not seem at all surprising. It was just like Marlowe, right? Again, this is, you see the friendship between these people. It was accepted in silence. No one took the trouble to grunt even. And that's interesting, right? Because he's he's on to something. He's going to expand on this idea. Uh, but his his friends, and then by extension, the cultural institutions that they represent, it's not clear that they are in a place to hear the story that he's going to share. It's not clear that they are in a place to think on the, the issues and the struggles uh, that he wants to, to contemplate, that he wants to think about. I was thinking of very old times when the Romans first came here 1900 years ago, the other day. You're going to see this tension here because he's thinking about the past, but then we're going to get these images where it's like things are, they're fast, right? Or it's, it was recent. And so he seems to be pointing out like in the course of human history, uh, it, it's really not so long ago, right? We're really not past that. And so what he's referring back to is like Rome settling the British Isles, right? Uh, bringing these legionnaires, bringing the up into uh, the Britons. And there you would have had essentially Britain was controlled by Celtic peoples, right? Um, people with their, with their religion and their own cultural practices, fighting their own wars and things like that. And then in comes Rome with its, you know, modern technology, its organization, its ability to build roads, its ability to set up, um, you know, governance and law and a written word and, and a, a judicial system. And so here he's, he's referring back to, hey, the, the people of this land, right? These Celtic people, these are, you know, people that many of these uh, the Britainers are sort of, uh, British people are descended from because they were once, the savages, right, is essentially where he's going. And what in the the light of civilization or the, the conquerors were these Romans coming in. We live in the flicker, may it last as long as old earth keeps rolling. But darkness was here yesterday, right? So you want to think about what does he what does he mean by darkness, right? Is it lack of sort of cultural development? Is it lack of civil institutions? Um, what, what is that referring to? And then in what way are these Celtic people sort of uh, different than the Romans who are bringing in uh, these cultural institutions? Imagine the feelings of a commander of a fine, what do you call them, trium in the Mediterranean, ordered suddenly to the north, run overland across the Gauls in a hurry, put in charge of one of these craft, the legionnaires, a wonderful lot of handy men they must have been too used to build apparently by the hundred in a month or two, if we may believe what we read. Imagine him here, the very end of the world. 
So we are right for the Roman coming from the, you know, the, the cultural sort of pinnacle of his day, right? At least within Europe going from like, you know, they thought they had, they were civilization for their time period. And he's leaving that and headed into the wilderness, headed into the wild to face these savage people, these barbaric people, right? And it's the Gauls and it's the Celts. It's the people of, you know, uh, of, of North, Northern Europe and of the British Isles. When he says savages here, so Sandbanks, Marshes, Forest, savages, he's referring to the people of that land, right? And so there's this question of, well, what, what made them different from the Romans who were coming in? And then how is, is Britain now sort of the, the modern inheritor of those social institutions and of that sort of that culture uh, that Rome brought? Um, he talks here about this danger, right? And this is going to be interesting because later he'll talk about the danger of the Congo. And there's a lot of parallel between the danger that the Roman faced coming up the River Thames and the danger that he's going to face in the Congo, moving up the Congo River. So death skulking in the air, in the water, in the bush. Uh, they must have been dying like flies. And what we're going to see is these the, the Europeans in the Congo, these Belgian people, um, they are dying like flies. Um, they were men enough to face the darkness. This is the thing that he's saying, like these Romans, this is what they're going to brag about, right? They faced the darkness there. Um, land in a swamp, march through the woods, and in some inland posts feel the savagery, the utter savagery, right? Again, because we've, we've talked a little bit about this word with our um, in our opening notes and thinking about what do we mean when we say something is savage. Here he's referring to the British people, right? Like the, 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 um, the tribal people that lived in this area, that, that these were the savages of their day, right? Well, he's, we're talking to and of the descendants of those people. There's no initiation either into such mysteries. This is going to be an idea that comes up throughout this text, that when you face this, this danger, when you face this wild, um, it seems to be this notion that there's there's no transitioning into it, right? That it's something that you face by just being sort of overwhelmed by it, overcome by it, um, thrown into the midst of it, um, almost like like learning a foreign language through immersion, right? Like you don't speak the language, but now you're just in that population, and so if you're going to learn to communicate, you better learn it quickly, right? Um, there's no gentle initiation there. The fascination of the abomination, you know. Imagine the, grown, imagine the growing regrets, the longing to escape, the powerless disgust, the surrender, the hate. So he's trying to put himself contemplatively into the position of one of these Romans. Again, come from that civilization, finding yourself in this place of, you know, that doesn't have the same level of development, that doesn't have the same level of technology, that have a people that seem, uh, you know, different than you in some way, that have a different religion, that speak a different language, um, that are technologically not as, as developed as you are, and just the, the, the myriad of reactions that you would have, missing your home, feeling sort of d disgust and, and no ability to change things, um, surrender, like giving up, right? And even hatred, this, this anger against your position, this anger against the place that you're in. And then uh, obviously what would follow that is, is cruelty, right? And he pauses. Mind, he began lifting one arm from the elbow, the palm of the hand out, outwards, so that with his legs folded before him, he had the pose of a Buddha preaching in European clothes. So again, we, it's like Conrad's reminding us, remember, there's, as we hear this man sort of struggling with these ideas, thinking his way through these, that, that there is something of enlightenment here, right? There's some truth that he's trying to give. And uh, I, I think there's, there's something to be said for um, a sort of a, a profound truth is difficult to say, right? It can't be said in a sort of pithy way. It can't be said in a direct way um, that it's something that you have to wrestle with. And what's not clear is, are the other men on the boat willing to wrestle with the idea in the way he is? But he's going to keep talking. 
mind, none of us would feel exactly like this, right? So he is saying like, our position's different. What saves us is efficiency and the devotion to efficiency. Underline that word, circle it, put a star by it. This is going to be an, a, a really interesting idea for later in the text, because what we will see is actual you know, waste, and it's going to be offensive to him. Um, so we want to revisit later, what does he seem to mean by efficiency? And in what way can sort of efficiency uh, redeem something? They were no colonists, they were conquerors, right? Those two lines are in, in tension with each other. What would the difference between a colonist and a conqueror be? What different mindset would they be? If you were coming to an area to stay, would that change the way that you interacted with that area versus if you were coming to conquer, to dominate? Um, here we have, for that, uh, for that, you want only brute force. And he's gonna, he really looks down on this idea of brute force. It's important to point out that what he's going to see in the Congo is brute force, right? So he's here imagining what the Rome, how, how sort of brutal the, the Romans must have been. But we're gonna see that same brutality later when we see the Europeans in the Congo. Um, since your strength is just the accidental arising from the weakness of others, right? It's basically like force isn't a principle, right? Force is not something that uh, that should guide you. It's it's an accident of of circumstance, right? It's an it's an accident of time and place. It's an accident of cultural development. Um, it just happens that you've got the bigger weapons or the better metal or the whatever that is. It was just robbery with violence, aggravated murder on a great scale. Again, highlight that, underline that, do what you need to there. His judgment is being cast towards these Ro the Roman settlers of the past, the Roman conquerors of the past. Um, but that judgment is also going to cut towards the Europeans of his day, towards the Belgians of his day, and also you know, towards the British Empire of his day. The conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away of those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. Underline that section and maybe circle that is not a pretty thing. And this is in some ways going to seem like obvious to us that, you know, colonialism is bad and, and, and that these, you know, the excesses of, of sort of Western empire um, were bad. It was not obvious to the people of that day. Um, in fact, you know, many and we'll experience this in the text, but many of the people who supported this through, you know, donations or through starting businesses or many of the people who were actually going into these countries across the globe um, genuinely seem to have had the notion that they were doing a good thing. Right. And what he's pointing out here is that when when you look real close, um, that those nice ideas seem to go away, right? It, it's a messier business than what people seem to think and report in the newspaper. What redeems it only, or sorry, what redeems it is the idea only. And he's gonna talk about this idea. And I do have, I think there's a question there of well, what would redeem something like this, right? Is there an idea that is uh, profound enough. That is, that is, uh, that that can you know change uh, circumstances enough that would in fact redeem something like that. Is there good that can come out of this evil? He's again, Conrad is going as as Marlowe is struggling with this. Conrad sort of undercuts some of this too. We have at the end here and an unselfish belief in the idea, something you can set up and bow down before and offer a sacrifice to. Well, that now sounds like a dangerous idea, right? That this devotion to an idea becomes the worship of that idea. And the worship of the idea means that I can sacrifice the other. I can sacrifice, uh, you know, the, the native peoples in order to accomplish the idea. Well, that doesn't seem like redemption, right? And so there's this tension between this idea that redeems and an idea that becomes a sort of a religious devotion that requires a sacrifice. Um, that's violence, right? That requires a kind of violence. 
He broke off. The flames glided in the river, small green flames, red flames, white flames, pursuing, overtaking, joining, crossing each other. That's these boats with their lights moving across, right? Then separating slowly or hastily, the traffic of the great city went on in the deepening night upon the sleepless river. We looked on waiting patiently. There was nothing else to do till the end of the flood. Again, they're in this in-between moment still. Right, they're 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 trapped here, uh, and they're going to listen to his story. But it was only after a long silence when he said, in a hesitating voice, and I like that that hesitating. I suppose you fellows remember I did once turn freshwater sailor for a bit. This is he's going to start leading into his story. He's going to start telling us of how he came to um, find himself in a position with the with the activities in the Congo how he got down to the Congo, and then how eventually he made his way up the river. It is, I think this last bit is important to point out here. That we knew we were fated before the ebb began to run to hear about one of Marlowe's inconclusive experiences. And this idea of inconclusiveness, right? It's whatever message we're going to get from this is not going to be uh, a simple message, right? It's not going to be this straightforward. These things are bad and those things are good and do what's good and avoid the bad. Um, there's something about this where it's like he has a notion that, that there's this great evil. He has a notion that this is a tragic. Um, he has a notion of what's what's good here and what could be redeemed. But everything is sort of in it's inconclusive in some way. Um, keep that in mind as we as we go to the end of the text. All right, y'all, that is what I have for the opening. Like I said, that should put you about through page five and lead you basically right into where Marlowe starts telling us his story. Um, you want to start making your run through chapter one. Keep those notes going. Like I have said earlier, um, this is your book. I want you to write all over it. It should look old and worn by the time we're done with it. Um, give yourself time. This is not the kind of book you can just sit down and read for an hour. Um, you want to read it in, for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, put it down and do something else. Come back to it later. Um, allow yourself that time to think about it. Allow yourself to process that information. Remember, I've got resources on the website. We've got the audio book available there. Um, we have a link to a website that has some helpful annotations. It's worth noting that those annotations are, are generated by users. So, um, you know, they're not 100 percent perfect, but it is a community of people who love this book. Who are trying to sort of add their thoughts and ideas uh, to the to that text. All right. I hope that's helpful. Email me if you've got any questions.